John, can you start a little early? I can certainly start a little early. It's um, just after sunrise here, so <laughs> I'm coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. So please forgive my accent, everybody. Your accent is wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's always good to know. Thank you. Um, so if I uh, share my screen with you. If you are, if you are muted and you're not John, uh, please mute now. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, so this morning I'm going to talk about um, a little machine that I've put together uh, called a SCAMP. It's a little fourth base computer and it's designed for embedded applications. It uh, started about two, oops, sorry, two years ago with a conversation. I was talking to an American guy who I was living in Korea and it turned out we were both fourth fans and we got onto the subject of Arduinos and how popular Arduinos were. And we were lamenting the fact that um, fourth is not more widely used in the small embedded space because a lot of people just don't know about it. Um, fourth, as I'm sure everyone here knows, is much better for embedded applications than anything running on an Arduino in Java. Um, so it, the conversation evolved a bit and we got onto the subject of why can't you just buy an off the shelf embedded computer that's got fourth pre-installed and that's where it all kicked off. So the motivation behind this was to provide a turnkey fourth system. So something that people could take and use straight away. Uh, it's got fourth pre-installed. There's no barrier to entry. They don't have to install an IDE, compile code, download the code to their uh, development board or whatever, and then kick off that way. They can just use fourth straight out of the box. And the idea was to make fourth much more accessible. I also wanted to provide a system that was useful in the teaching environment. So something that could be used in university laboratories to give students more access to fourth, make it easier for professors to, to teach fourth. And I also want to provide a fourth tool that was useful de for debugging and developing other hardware. So if you've got a little system under test and you sometimes just want to waggle some bits or do a bit of control or a bit of testing, having a little fourth machine there, which you can just easily and instantly plug in and start working with uh, was a useful tool. And I also want to provide it, make it easier if people want to use fourth in larger systems. So if there was a, a pre-made, ready to go little fourth system, that you could simply drop into an existing, into a, a design that you're working on, um, I thought that would be better. So the question then came, well, what fourth to use? There are a lot of um, fourths available out there. So I started looking around to see the relative merits of the different ones, which ones seem to fit what I needed to do. And I settled on uh, Flash Forth. Now Flash Forth is written by a guy called Mikhail Nordman in Finland. I believe he works for Nokia as a software engineer. He's a very nice guy, very smart guy. And he has created Flash Forth. The source code, it's available under GPL3 from www.flashforth.com. If no one is familiar with it, wants to go and have a look. It's approximately 11,000 lines of assembler with very few comments. So once you dive in there, it's a bit hard to find your way around, but you can work it out if you go through it. One of the really nice things about uh, Flash Forth is that the dictionary is stored in Flash automatically. So when you create a word, that straight away goes into Flash. You can be working with your Flash Forth based machine, unplug it, come back a week later and your dictionary is just as you left it. Um, but there's nothing to, to make, you know, to, that you lose when you unplug. Uh, you can store the variables in either RAM or Flash. So um, again, variables, if, when they're stored in Flash, they contain their value when the system is powered down. And it's also very easy to make a standalone embedded system. Once you've got your final fourth application written as a single word, um, you can simply make it uh, that the turnkey word and the Flash Forth system will boot into that on startup. One of the things I liked about it was that it's not ANSI. I'm not a huge fan of ANSI Forth, um, so for me that was a plus. Uh, but Flash Forth does have some quirks. So one example is that it has a for next instead of do loop. Um, there are a few little quirks in there which take a bit of getting used to. And it's available for the AVR, the PIC-18, the PIC-24 and the DSP. Uh, the AVR and the PIC-18 didn't have enough compute power for what I wanted. The DSP is a little bit more than what I wanted. So I set on the PIC-24 as the basis microcontroller for this. And I chose 
the PIC 24FJ64 GB202, which has got 64K of flash, 8K of RAM. When you install flash forth, it leaves you with 22K flash free and 5K of RAM free. Not a huge amount, but it's more than enough for most small applications. It's got a 20,000 erase cycle flash memory with minimum retention for 20 years. It has a hard data architecture, which means it's got two address generation units with separate read write addressing of the data space. It's got 16 bit data path and 24 bit addressing. There are 16 16 bit registers. It gives you up to 16 MIPS operation from a 32 megahertz CPU clock. And it's got a single cycle for hardware fractional and integer multiplier and a hardware divider. So in terms of computing power, it's um, reasonably capable and a little microcontroller. In terms of peripherals, it's got six PWM modules. It's got six input capture modules. It's got a couple of spy interfaces. It's got I squared C and I two S modules. There are four UARTs there. It's also got on-chip FSK and PSK modulation. It can sync and source up to 18 milliamps on its IO pins. And most of those peripheral functions are software remappable to most pins. So you can allocate a particular peripheral to a pin and then reallocate a different peripheral to the same pin later on. So from a general purpose force computer, that was a particularly useful function that gives you a lot of flexibility in how you use the machine. The processor has also got an on-chip USB 2.0 interface. It's got a cryptographic engine. It's got uh, a DES and a triple DES engine. It's got a 32-bit CRC generator on board. It's also got a true hardware random number generator and a pseudo random number generator. And it's also got non-readable on-chip OTP key storage. But one of the problems was that Flashforth didn't actually have any USB support for this particular processor. Um, Mikhail Nordman, with his various versions of Flashforth, the PIC-18 version um, has support for USB, but not for the PIC-24. So I contacted Mikhail and said, you've got USB support for the PIC-18. If you have any ideas about when you might do USB support for uh, the PIC-24. And he said that the problem was he would love to do that. He thought about doing that, but he didn't actually have a PIC-24 with a USB port or a USB interface to test with. So that didn't seem to be too much of a barrier. So I sat down that day and catted up a little PIC-24 based board with a USB port, got the design, PCBs made up, hand soldered it and shipped it off to him and we had that within a week. At which point I got a, uh, an email back from Mikhail saying he got it, it's great, he loved it, but it was summer in Finland and there were better things to do, so I can't expect USB support anytime soon, which is fine, that, that was okay. Um, but a few months later, I think once it got a bit cold in Finland and uh, it wasn't so much to do outside, uh, within no time there was USB support. In the meantime, I'd done various different versions of um, the board. The board you can see there, that was the original prototype. It was sort of an Arduino form factor. So the idea, in the same way, use an Arduino. In working with it, there were a few problems with it. One was that um, you had to use it with a breadboard, which seemed to be a bit of a limitation. And also being such a small form factor, I found it personally very hard to read the little labels on there. Um, getting a bit on in years, so as, as some people also are, I think. Um, it's just a bit hard to see the small stuff. So the design evolved over time to be more like that, which is the current version of this type of scan board. So it's got a long edge connector down one side, um, which you can plug uh, peripherals into. If you insert a header into that, you can plug it into a breadboard or you can uh, use the header to solder it into a, a, a secondary PCB. So you can use it as a drop-in module on a larger system. Or you can simply just plug wires into it interactively, um, which makes it really easy to connect things up to do tests. It's, it's a very fast little system to use and deploy. On board, you've got the PIC24 process on the right-hand side. Uh, on the far left, uh, the little four pin device is the voltage regulator that can work up for 12 volts um, input. You can either power the device externally or you can run off USB power. Also on board is a temperature sensor and there's also a bank of LEDs. You've got one amber status LED and you've got 16 red LEDs, which can be all configured under fourth. Along the edge of the connector, you can see various labels. Um, there's power ground, I squared C, and there are pins labeled one through 12. 
those can be accessed within my version of Flash, Flash Forth um, directly. So you can simply talk, refer to a pin by its pin number there uh, in the uh, words that I've written. So I've extended Flash Forth to provide some simple IO uh, beyond what Flash Forth can do. Flash Forth is just a basically a standard vanilla Forth with no specific hardware support. I've written simple words which can control uh, analog input, digital IO, I squared C, PWM, et cetera. So what I might do now, if this all works, is give you a quick demo. So if I swap across uh, to do this in just a moment, to the terminal. And if I change that to that, hopefully you're seeing Okay, so you can um, see the board and can you also see a terminal screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so if you, you can actually, this little slider which you can resize the picture of the board uh, and also the terminals, you can adjust that to be an appropriate size if it makes it easier to look at. I'll just, excuse me, I'm just going to move a window out of the way so I can actually see what I'm doing. Okay, so the flash forth, when you connect the, uh, the scan board to your computer, you don't need to install any IDE or any software to use. It's all self-contained on the scan. It's running forth. Um, it appears as a USB modem device. So you can simply connect to it using a screen. And that's all that's required to connect to it. It's, it runs, talks to any host straight out of the box. There's nothing more to install. There's no, no drivers required to install. It will work with any machine that you've got. So, um, <clears throat> You've got a word called free, which shows you how much memory is available. Uh, that's the dictionary. If I can, so let's try to do that. Um, I have added to Flash Force to provide some additional uh, words, as I said. Um, there's some very basic um, VT100 support. So you can clear the screen. You can um, do bold, underline, that sort of thing. You have some basic color support, so there's seven foreground, three background. And to give you an example of that, so if I copy and paste some code. So it makes it easy to do some very simple terminal support. You can also uh, navigate around um, the terminal screen uh, with OT command. So if I go uh, 20, 10, So forth. So if you look at the uh, view of the scan, you've also got um, status labs on board, which you can use inside your fourth words for debugging or whatever purpose you want. So if I type lead on, it turns on the amber status lead. Lead off turns it off. You can also blink the lead. Well, there's also a bank of uh, 16 LEDs, which you can use uh, for status. So if I say, uh, 
Unfortunately, the LEDs are a little bit bright, so I think they tend to wash out a little bit on the, the screen. So maybe um, it seems to be all blurring together on the video, but um, if you're here in person, I'm gonna show you they're all nice and distinct and separate um, and so forth. So that, that's very useful to use inside your, um, your program. Um, you can use the random number generator. There's a little sample word I've just dropped in. So I've called it Lincoln. Um, you begin, uh, use the random number generator, pass that value to the LEDs, uh, 200 millisecond delay, wait until the key's pressed, and then exit the loop, turning the LEDs off. So if I run that, you should see a nice little random LED display uh, on the scan, just for a bit of fun. These words are all, all built into a uh, version of flash force on the scan. Um, so I can create a word called my prompt and simply duplicate the value on the stack and pass that to the lens. And then I go tick. Um, you have a spelling error there. Where was that? Oh, I've left out. Ah, yes, thank you, thank you. That's uh, yeah. I have to type the incorrect one. Thank you. I missed that. Ah. Ah. It's one of those mornings. It's, it's very early here, so you have to forgive me. Uh, tick my prompt is prompt. There we go. That's what I want to do. Okay. So if I then type the value onto the stack. You can see that echoes through to the LEDs. So you can use the LEDs. Well, I've set the LEDs to basically reflect whatever the top of the stack is quite simply and easily in there. Uh, I'll just restore that back to what it was. Um, um, okay, so where are we up to? There's also a temperature sensor on board. And you can access it simply with the temp word. The first value is the integer temperature in degrees Celsius. And the second value is the fractional uh, component of that. So the current temperature here is uh, 30.25 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that's about 85 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. So yeah, it's quite hot here. What it doesn't tell you is it's also 90% humidity. So, um, and that, that's very early in the morning here in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, so that's the temperature sensor. Now you've also got um, analog input on this. So what I will do to connect through, so if I just hold that up, I hope everyone can see that. Uh, I plug in, I'm plugging in a potentiometer. So I connect the ground, I connect that to VCC, PV3, and I'll wire that to pin two. There we go. Okay, so there's a potentiometer. So that was pin two. So I can simply say pin two is an, oops, pin two is an analog input. And then pin two is the channel that I want to sample. And then I can simply sample it. If I then adjust the potentiometer, and sample that again. Just with the other one all the way down. So it's it's very easy to do um, analog input with that. As well as that, you've got um, support for digital I/O. So I have got a push button switch here. Now if I connect back to pin three and I hope this is not too too confusing for people. It's a bit awkward to do it off the camera. So that's simply a push button switch connected to pin three. So I simply say pin three is the switch. And I say three get 
I've got. And you read the value of the switch. So the word switch um, configures that pin as an input um, and also turns on, activates a pull up resistor. So there's no need for an external pull up resistor. If I then push the button, which closes the switch and connects that to ground, if I then say three get dot as well, it reads a zero. So doing simple things like switches and digital input and output is very easy. This uh, switch also has an LED on board. So if I connect, uh, where are back to ground and let's say pin six there. And hopefully you can see the switch. If I say pin six is an output and then I can say pin six set. Ah. Well, let me try that again. The grim ones are busy this one. I'll try that again. Try that with pin five. Pin six. Pin five is an output. Set. No, I think I've got a dead LED in that, I'm afraid. Okay, not to worry. I'll move on from that. Um, okay. <clears throat> Regardless, though, you can you can drive input and output um, directly uh, straight from the command line, which is very useful. There's I2C support, so you've got a modules word, which scans the I2C bus and reports uh, what devices it finds. So the device at address 27 is the uh, GPIO expander that controls the LED blank. Okay? And the device at address 37 is the temperature sensor. So I can simply type um, I squared C packets at the command line to talk to something. So I can say address 37 and ping it, which gives me a Boolean back to say that it's found something. Uh, if I tried that with address 40, it doesn't find a device there. So it's useful uh, to test the I squared C bus to uh, very quickly and easily work out whether you can talk to a device or not. And the other nice thing is you can actually type I squared C packets at the command line. Um, so the temperature sensor at address 37, I type start, address 37, and I want to read from that. That will give me a Boolean back, which I don't care about. So I'll drop that. I'll then do a receive and send it a knowledge. The temperature sensor requires you to receive, get two bytes from it. So I'll do a second receive and then a NAC to tell that's all I want. I don't want the second byte, so I'll drop that and then issue a stop. And that's read the temperature from the temperature sensor, a value of 31. So it makes doing I squared C work very, very simple. Uh, it's very easy to interact with hardware. Uh, particularly in, in another system, if you need to do some testing of an I squared C bus, uh, it's very useful to have something you can very easily and very quickly interact with. So what I thought I might do now, um, Kevin, is uh, hand over control to either you or to somebody else and you can uh, have a test drive remotely. So if you'd like to uh, take access, uh, please feel free. I think you need to initiate we'll, that. We'll leave that to a uh, volunteer from the audience. But uh, while we're thinking about volunteering, I'd like to ask you if, if I couldn't live without one of these things, how could I get one? Uh, you can get them off Tindy. Um, so if you go to Tindy and search for scan, um, you should be able to find them there. Uh, you can also go to eudaimonic.com. That's my uh, little business website. And there are links there to get them. They're, they're 1995 US. I try to keep the price as low as I can. How do you um, spell that? Eudaimonic is UD. Hang on, I'll show you. I'll put it on screen for you. <laughs> there you go. How's that? Thank you very much. That's all this right. Is, this is fantastic. It's <laughs> it's very much an equivalent to uh, Android, maybe not with the libraries, but uh, sorry, Arduino. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. fantastic. I love the layout and the fact Thank that you can put it into a breadboard. It's it's really excellent. Uh, very easy to use. I, I I'm quite impressed. Okay, that, that's not. Thank you. That's nice. Nice to hear. I appreciate that. Um, I I tried to make it simple. 
there are a lot of peripherals on board this PIC-24. It's, it's very, very capable. I haven't provided support directly for a lot of the more complicated stuff, um, simply because it was going to mean that the dictionary was going to be huge um, and not everybody wants to access everything all the time. Um, so I simply provided extra support for the, the really simple, obvious stuff like the ABC and GPIO, uh, I squared C and so forth. Um, there's also, I was going to have a, a motor demo, but it was too hard to, to get it organized with the camera. Um, but there's also PWM support. So you can do very simple PWM, oh, sorry, quite sophisticated PWM control straight from the command line, which makes it um, really useful. Just as again, my nephew's into model railroads and I, I built a controller for him um, based on an Arduino. Um, and it took me a couple of hours to get the code. And it wasn't so much that the code was complicated, it was just spending more time messing around with the ID and working out what libraries to use and so forth. And then sometime later, once I had the scamp, I, I redid that controller using a scamp. And it literally took me less than a minute to write the software and get it all working and have it as a deployable controller for his model railroad. Um, so it really is quite fast and quite capable when you need to do things like that. It won't do everything you can possibly do, but as a simple little Arduino replacement, um, it's very quick, it's much faster than Arduino, um, and it's um, very easy to use. So, yeah. So if somebody would like to take control and, and, and have a go, um, you're more than welcome to. Brad, you want to volunteer? Everyone's shy. Everyone's shy. No takers? No takers. Kevin, would you like Kevin, to have a go? Charles, uh, Charles, you're not, uh, muted, you're not muted, so I assume so you're volunteering. Uh, no, not volunteering. I was going to make a comment when the volunteering session was over. <laughs> okay, I declare it over. Uh, Charles, what you have to say? Yeah, John, I just want to say you missed an opportunity to do palindromic LEDs. <laughs> You're more, you're more than welcome to take over, Charles, and, and, and do that. I offer you the console. Uh, John. <laughs> I may buy one and do it. That hey, John, I, I just bought one. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, also, I saw your uh, scamp, and I just remembered the scamp, which some of us old timers uh, had used. It was a microprocessor, I think, na National Semiconductor. Yes, it was. I, I actually named this as a nod to that old system because uh, I was trying to think of what to call this, and I think that it just sort of popped into my head. So that, that's what I called it. So, good choice. So the, the idea was it was um, that that old system was a very good learning tool. A lot of people found it particularly useful. So I thought this this would be a, a nod to that. What are you showing, Adrian? <laughs> this one is almost exactly the same, um, except it's in two parts. That's the processor, and that's just the USB to TTL. Um, yeah. It doesn't have a temperature sensor, uh, but it has, I think, almost all the other functionality. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, like, like yours, it, it saves it to... Uh, to flash as you go along, basically. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Uh, well, not quite. You have to do a, a save command properly. You just don't oh, okay. depower it. Yeah. Um, and then 
it, it has a, a word there called smudge, which you can smudge uh, a, a word and it will remove it from the vocabulary. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. So but just a bit, yeah. I, I, I've, I've, you, you've seen me create these words here. So if I just unplug the scamp, so you'll note the power lead goes off. That's completely dead. I've lost um, access on the thermal session. I plug it back right. in, scamp powers up. I reconnect to it. And that word is still there. Nothing to do, easy. It just retains it straight away. So you can come back a year later and all your dictionaries as you left it. So you can see down the bottom of the dictionary, those are the words I, I created earlier. Um, do you, any other questions? Yeah. So like this board, is there, is there a word to remove something from the dictionary? Yes, there is. So uh, I'll get rid of my uh, mistyped prompt word. Stop. Uh, the other thing I can do is I can go empty, which uh, wipes everything away. Yeah, okay. I'll put the uh, address back up if anybody wants it. Um, so no, no take us through a demo because you're, um, you're more than welcome to try some forth if you want to. You will see some differences with this. So for example, um, if I create a word called test, um, uh, let's see, um, four, uh, three, two, three minutes. So that, that's how you do a loop inside uh, Flash 4. So 4 takes one parameter off the stack uh, rather than two, like do loop. Um, and that does the loop. So if I do five and so forth. When I first started to move Flash 4 onto this machine, I actually uh, re restored do loop, changed uh, from 4 next back to do loop. And I sent a, a version of the scamp to, uh, to Mikhail to test drive. And he wrote back and said, very nice, but please put it back to four next because uh, that's, that's what he preferred. So I respected his, uh, his request because it's uh, his version of fourth. So we've got four next. Um, so there, there's, the, there's also, there's no um, query dupe that doesn't work, that doesn't exist under flash fourth. Flash fourth, um, the word, the dupe word, um, looks at the stack and if there's nothing on the stack, it just um, ignores it. So you can just use a dupe in place. A um, few, few little things like that. So there are some little quirks, uh, which they're not they're not big deals, but they do trip me up occasionally. I, go, I used to other versions of force and you got to do something and it's a little, something a little bit different, but most of the time it looks pretty good. Okay, any other questions? It looks like not. Okay. Well, thank you can, very much. For can we, uh, John, can we bring yep. you back in January and have a designated uh, partner for your uh, remote share uh, and maybe uh, explore uh, in a little more detail your, uh, your implementation? Uh, yeah. I, I keep dropping out. I keep losing my connection. So uh, as, as many of you know, <laughs> I have uh, told Bill and Brad uh, that if I'm not online, uh, can feel free to uh, take uh, my role as soon as uh, someone knows what my role is. Uh, but thank you so much for your presentation and for your patience with, with our reluctance to. Uh, it's okay. I appreciate the time. To, I appreciate your interest. Um, it, it's my pleasure to show it. So uh, I hope people like it. Jurgen, are you still around? 
Hello, Jurgen. Yes, I am. Uh, in a couple of minutes, I'd like you to consider giving a little plug for your uh, online uh, availability of the uh, Jurgen's uh, fourth bookshelf. Uh, are you willing to do that? Sorry, sometimes it's muted again. Would, would you like to talk briefly about your uh, fourth book? Oh, you mean now? In uh, one minute and 23 seconds from now. <laughs> okay. While we're waiting for that to start, I'd like to ask how many of you uh, have coming in the mail soon? One of Bowman's uh, Dazzler Arduino uh, or Gameduino boards. All right, you're just a pack of air duels and uh, you missed the boat on the first round of those. You're gonna have to uh, maybe get one later, I guess. Okay, Jurgen, you're on. Right, hello everybody. Um, I don't know who of you know about the uh, fourth of background. I got uh, starting forth about probably 30 years ago as a present and it got uh, stored away and uh, sometimes looked at, but very often not until about 10 years ago, roughly, when I met um, MPE again in my function as a salesman, which is uh, a word that's not very much liked here with all the programmers who think uh, programming is the most important in the world. But what happened is that uh, MPE said, yeah, if you're interested in a part-time support for fourth, uh, we'll pay you a little and uh, you can promote things and uh, one thing that happened then is that I probably did the first press releases for forth for a long long time and I realized that one of the most important things was missing documentation. Uh, there are loads of uh, documentations around uh, that are hidden from people probably who don't know where to search. So I thought, well, let's turn it on its head and let's start a documentation. So uh, there's one person up here, which is Dr. Ting, who was very helpful at the time. And uh, basically he agreed on the fact that uh, having the documentations out would help him uh, to talk to people about uh, selling the source codes. And that's uh, part of how the whole thing started. Uh, then I talked to Chuck and said, well, your documentation is there somewhere, but it's not in the format that's nice to flick through or to give some to somebody as a present. And Chuck was very happy to say, yeah, do whatever you like uh, to make it available. So first I did uh, the early years as an ebook, and uh, then uh, I did the um, uh, the next one as an ebook as well. And it got more interesting when people asked me actually to do, uh, can you do it as print book because that's what you can flick through. And uh, so basically, over time, uh, I have now about I think 15 to 20 documentations that are available on Amazon and the choice for Amazon was very simple. The point was, how do you actually distribute that worldwide? I don't have the time and I don't have the money to support all of that. So Amazon was the very simple way of making it available worldwide. And that's now for about seven years and the books are coming. And one of the most interesting ones actually is the one regarding the Arduino, 
where people can download it from uh, many places, uh, put it into the Ardu Arduino and uh, run uh, things forth. And there are, there's another one that I'm planning to do and hopefully I have the time next year is the one on the node CPU. That's the ESP8266, I think. And that basically concludes what I can say about the whole fourth bookshelf. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Uh, apparently nobody has any. Uh, is this stuff from uh, Amazon, the paper books, are they print to order? Yes. Or do they have, I, okay, that's great. You mostly get them as ebook, uh, then they're a lot cheaper or you have them as print book and then it's obviously a lot nicer uh, and you can put it on to, uh, to your other ebooks, uh, other books that you have on your shelf. All right, thank you so much, Jurgen. Uh, let me ask, is uh, Don uh, on? I guess not, okay. Well, maybe he's desperately busy at this time because sometimes that happens. Uh, all right, Any uh, anything else? Uh, it's got coming attractions. We may be hearing from uh, Leon Wagner uh, next month. Uh, I know we're going to hear from, uh, from, uh, what's his name? John, <laughs> who's, uh, Katsoulis? John, that's how your last name's pronounced? All right, then. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's great. <laughs> close enough. Anyone, uh, sorry, sorry. Any one of you ne'er-do-wells that wants to present next month, now's a good time to start thinking about it. Uh, please contact me, let me know, it's, the sooner the better. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, now, I guess, stop recording and uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, we'll uh, de uh, devolve into uh, uh, chat amongst yourselves mode.